Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day. Welcome to each and every one of you who are here today. Welcome to all of our guests and all those who are listening in online. Now we're at a later time. Welcome. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful for you. You are high and lifted up, exalted, infinite and beyond comprehension, revealing yourself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one being, holy all the way through. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you so very much for the wonderful way in which you have created us as humans. And we marvel that you even take a second look at us. We marvel that you love us. We, love, we, we marvel and we love you for the salvation that you have brought us in Jesus Christ, him crucified and resurrected. Jesus, we thank you. And Father, in Jesus, we thank you so very much for the precious gift of your Holy Spirit that you dwell in us like a temple, in us as individuals and as us as a church. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful. We are so grateful. Spirit, we are so grateful that you are here with us. Now, Lord God, we pray that you would move among us. We pray that you would teach us, rebuke us, correct us, and train us in righteousness through your holy word, by your spirit. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would feed each and every person here today. Lord God, come. In your name do we pray. Amen. What or who do we take for granted? Generally, we take something or someone for granted. We treat that person or object without the least bit of courtesy or honor. The question arising for us from our text today is this. Do we take God for granted and treat him without the honor that he deserves? Our text for today, if you want to open up with us to 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1, we're simply going to summarize the story as because it's just been read. We'll pull out a few highlights for you. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. Now, we may have understood from chapter 5 that events happened rapidly, almost instantaneously. And indeed, in places, the tumors did break out upon people instantaneously. Yet the entire process of God's judgment upon the Philistines and the Philistines' God, as well as the movement of the ark from, uh, over the course of three different cities, was a process that took seven months. The Philistines endured the tumors, they endured the mice, they endured the panic, approximately seven months. Now, why does that also matter? That matters not just for God's judgment upon the Philistines, but that's also God's disciplining Israel. The ark was absent from Israel for seven months. And that meant that there was a majority of their sacrifices that were not able to be held, that could not take place because the ark of God was missing. There were certain rituals and certain things that simply could not be done. And so the ark was, the being an exile amongst the Philistines, was both a judgment upon them and a disciplining for Israel. And notice what they do then here in verse 2. They call out their religious professionals and ask them, what should we do? 
And we're meant to take it as a bit of a sign, a bit of God's mercy, that uh, they actually somewhat knew what somewhat knew what to do, and they got the general idea right that they need to make some sort of restitution to God, and they had to send the ark on its way. And so they tell them, hey, make golden tumors, five, make five golden mice, set it on an ark, to put two never-before-yoked cows to it, and send them on their way and see where they go. Right? Now, for most of us here, the, the test is very, very obvious to understand. The two milk cows that are unyoked would have had the natural and normal capacity to simply go where they wanted to go. And where they would want to go, namely, is back to their offspring. Take a look here in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7 and on. Now then, take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows, on which there has never come a yoke, and yoke the cows to their cart, but take their calves home away from them. Their natural place to go would have been home. And so this is the test. Hey, send it off to its own land. Send it up to Beth Shemesh. Then it is he who has done us this great harm. If the milk cows go on their way um, towards Beth Shemesh without veering from the road, but if they get off the side of the road and start eating grass or they go home, we know that this entire scenario is just coincidence. And this is sort of like human beings do. We test and we find a sign, but then we don't quite believe it. So we have to have another test. And here is the next test for them. I'd like to show us some maps today from Zondervan's Bible Atlas, um, edited by Rasmussen. The first picture is not going to be legible, so I'm going to simply prepare you for it. It's going to be simply a wider angle of Israel. The second map is going to be zoomed in where you can read it. So let's take a look here today. Get our bearing, bearings. We are in southern Israel, and you see that this is going to be the Mediterranean Sea over here. You've got the Dead Sea, or the Salt Sea, the Jordan River running northward from that, or actually the Jordan River runs south into it. Then you also have the city of Jerusalem. Those are going to be the major landmarks for us. So we're in southern Israel. The land of the Philistines is going to be over here in the Mediterranean. Let's move into our zoomed-in second map. It's just simply harder to get bearings of where we are when it's very zoomed in like this. But you'll see three different Philistine cities. You've got Ashdod there. It's, uh, old name's partly cut off. Ashdod. It then moved down to Gath, where plague broke out. Then the ark moved up to Ekron. Now you see here, as you go in, if you start to see these crinkles, this is mountainous territory. Here's Jerusalem, up in the mountains. Here, Beth Shemesh, then, you're at the edge, uh, kind of on the foothills almost, or you're starting to get into the mountains. Ekron, then, is going to be down in the plains. Technically, Ekron is about 101 meters of elevation. Beth Shemesh is somewhere around 219 meters of elevation. So between this way, as the cows go up, not only are they going away from their offspring, they're going by the road in the right direction, but they're also pulling the cart somewhat uphill the entire way. Something that you would never understand without a map. Okay? Now, where the ark will end up at the end of the story is going to be up here in Kirith Jerim. We're going to get there next week. But this is simply the trajectory of the ark, where it goes further upwards into the mountains. So that's um, the, the, the course of the ark, and it's just, it's unique, and what we have to understand is that the milk cows would never have gone to their destination without God's powerful hands at work upon them to make it go up. Well, the cows go on their way, verse 11. Verse 12, they find their way there. Now take a look here in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12, because something interesting happens. Verse 12 says this, And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. 
Now, when we read that text, immediately we're just thinking, well, the lords of the Philistines are making sure the ark gets to where it's going, right? That somewhere along the way, the cows don't veer off in a certain direction and start munching in the grass, and the ark is just left out there, and, well, this whole thing was really just a coincidence to begin with. That's how we would normally read the text. What's fascinating is also taking a look at this through ancient Near Eastern eyes. If you're in the ancient Near East, what you would understand is that when a king is marching home from a major victory, they would usually trail captives in their wake, trail their enemies that they've taken prisoner in their wake, and the king would be out in front, usually on their litter, being carried and moved as they go into the city, and there would be great celebration. And so what does this actually look like in ancient Near Eastern eyes? The Lord, his footstool is on the ark. He's being moved into his own territory, into his own city. And here come trailing behind him all the people he's conquered, the lords of the Philistines. Okay, This is also a victory procession. And the Lord has had his victory over the Philistines by himself. Now take a look here in verse 13. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. When they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark, they rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there. When you see those little details like that, you need to pay attention because what this is indicating is that this is a very clear historical memory. It stopped in a certain field owned by a certain person that was known to the people of the time. They knew right where this was, right? So this is an instance telling us, yes, this historically happened, and you can know it, and if you were of the time, all you'd have to do is go talk with Joshua or his family, and they would tell you that it's true. Now, there's something else interesting here. But let's move into verse 19, and then we'll get into it. Look here in verse 19. And he, namely God, or sometimes you'll see it, the ark, and he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them in the ESV, if you look down at your footnote, if you're using the ESV, it should say, struck of the people 70 men, 50,000. The translation earlier read was 50,070 men. What's going on here? Well, we're not quite sure what the figure is. The Hebrew literally just reads 70, 50,000. Okay? Now, it's hard for us to imagine what that 50,000 is in reference to. Is it in reference just to that little town of Beth Shemesh? If it is, the word thousand in Hebrew can also be translated um, clan or tribe, in which case you might want to say, well, it's 70 out of the 50 tribes that were located there, or, or well, there can't be 50 tribes, so it would be 50 clans, 50 family groups. Or is it really that there was 50,000 throughout all of Israel that were struck? We're not quite sure. All right. Here's the key thing. The Lord disciplined Beth Shemesh and the people of Israel by striking dead at least 70 people, if not a great slaughter among them, which would be 50,070. Now let me just... Put that out there again for you. Listen well with your heart. The Lord struck at least 70 people dead, if not 50,070 people dead, because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. Do you hear what the text is saying? Then the next question should, should immediately be, why? Why would the Lord strike his own people with death for looking upon the ark? 
Well, there's several things here that begin to make sense of the text. Beth Shemesh is actually a Levite town. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 21. In Joshua chapter 21, you'll find the people parceling out part of their cities amongst all of the different tribes for the Levites to dwell in. The Levites are going to be those people who take care of the tabernacle, who eventually take care of the temple. It is their job to do so, and it is their lot to be priests unto the Lord. Moses was a Levite. Aaron was a Levite. Their Levite, their descendants were Levites. These were people who should know how to treat the ark and how to take care of the tabernacle. And if not the majority of them, at least the leaders among them should have known why they served in that role at least parts of the year all the time. Take a look here in Joshua chapter 21, verse 16. Ain with its pasture lands, Juta with its pasture lands, Beth Shemesh with its pasture lands. This is a Levite city and town. Number two, and heading back into 1 Samuel, many translations and many commentators will say that actually what this means is not that they just looked upon the ark, but that they looked into the ark of the Lord which was not their role and place. Three, this is what I would say. Number three, they're leaving the ark of the Lord out in open view when they know it should be covered up, when they know the king would want to go back to his palace. That's what kings want to do. They don't just stand in the marketplace. They go back to their palace. The king just marched back victorious from the Philistines. What he wants to do is go off to the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, not be gazed on by a bunch of unclean, unsanctified farmers. No offense. Did you notice that? As they're looking upon the ark, there is not one among them who take any of the necessary rituals or precautions. None of them are recorded to become clean. None of them are recorded to be sanctified unto the Lord. What do they do? They simply offer the milk cows. By the way, female cows were not normally a regular offering. Usually it was male um, animals. Sometimes a heifer was offered. Not normally females were offered. Okay? So they have the wrong sacrifice. They're Levites. They're not cleansed. They're not sanctified. They're not set apart. They're not letting the Lord have his own privacy. Instead, they stare at the ark or look into the ark of the Lord. I know there's some faces still scrunching up and going, well, what's the big idea? What's the issue? What's the problem? It's this. The Israelites were taking the Lord for granted. They had removed the proper sense of honor and holiness due to the Lord. Wow. Lord won a great victory. Awesome. Let's all look into the ark and see what's there. The Lord struck them down. And then the reoccurring problem among the Israelites happens here in verse 20. Did you notice this? The men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up away from us? Guess who is supposed to be able to stand before him if they were holy and having the proper rituals done? The Levites! So why are they asking the question? but they don't take any steps to repair the relationship with the Lord. They don't take any steps to go to the Lord to figure out what's the matter. They do not go to Samuel and figure out what's going on. Instead, what happens? Get this. The Levites, the priests who are meant to take care of the ark, pass the buck as if they're Philistines. Send it on to the next city. 
Send the Lord on. And we find them being in the same place as the Philistines. We find them in the same spiritual location. They have no clue on how to properly honor the Lord. I'm driven this morning right into our practical application from the text. How often do we treat the Lord in a less dignified, less honored position than he deserves? How often do we treat the Lord without any sense or measure of holiness? How often do we take the Lord for granted? The Lord, through Jesus Christ, has won himself and won for all those who believe in him a great victory through the cross and, re and uh, resurrection. Victory over sin, atonement for our sin, reconciliation with the Father, victory over death, victory over Satan, victory over this world. Jesus did this himself. He won the victory for us. When we are born again and know that we are saved so that we know we have faith, we can very often be in a state of rejoicing. There is a special sort of rejoicing that lasts days to weeks to months. Then there is the unending rejoicing, the unending joy that permeates our hearts, minds, souls, and bodies and our very lives. We rejoice because of what God has done for us. Yet are we like the Levites in Beth Shemesh? Are we careless with God? Let me bounce a few things off of this this morning. First, are we careless with God's word? The Levites in Beth Shemesh, Shemesh surely should have known how to care for the ark of the Lord. It's part of their job. We too are called to certain tasks in certain ways. We too are called to follow after Christ. We too are to love in the manner of 1 Corinthians 13, have courage in the manner of Revelation 21, treat others with the love of Matthew 5 through 7, praise God in the manner of Colossians 1 and Revelation 4 to 5, kill sin in the manner of Romans 7 and 8 and Colossians 3. We are called to be holy, sanctified to the Lord. We are called to feast on the word of God every day that we might meditate on his law day and night and then do what it says. Are we careless in our duty? Would we rather read a one-page devotional than the word of God? I am not making fun of one-page devotionals. They're very important. But I am saying this. Would we rather do that instead of read the Word? Do we find the Bible boring? Do we trivialize the Word and say we've learned enough about it because we read it a few times? What does your daily life with God say about how you honor God? Do we dishonor God in our homes? The practice of family worship, the gathering together of everyone in the household for a short time of scripture reading, prayer, and praising God is one of the most important things we can do outside gathering together as a church on Sunday mornings. Do you do family worship? Is the altar in a good state of repair in the home? Are you committed to honoring God in your house in this way? Is it filled with honoring God? Or is it filled with thoughts of what do we get to do after family worship if we do family worship in the first place? Do we dishonor God in our attitudes? God is our Father and Christ is our brother if we belong to the family of God if indeed we are saved by God's grace through faith. Yet respect, fear, and deep love is still required and expected. 
There are times to laugh with God, but most of the time should be filled with reverence, submission, gratitude, wonder, praise, and rejoicing. Do we treat God as if he was just a buddy, or even worse, as if we couldn't care less about him? The Lord Jesus Christ has won a great victory for us. We did nothing to deserve it, nothing to earn it. We did no part in it. He has done it. For those who believe in the name of Jesus, for those who are saved, how do you treat God in return? For those who are not saved, you trample on the Son of God and store up wrath for yourself. Repent and come to salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for every word in your scripture. Lord God, we pray that you might teach us out of it. Lord God, help us to see you high and lifted up. Help us to see you exalted on your throne. May we glorify you and praise you and teach us each and every day to honor you more, praise you more, adore you more, and love you more. Lord Jesus, come. In your name do we pray. Amen.